I'm an incurable collector, and I love it. I collect artifacts and documents that give me insight into people and times that really fascinate me. I've collected over a million artifacts for myself and for others, including over 500,000 pieces in the Museum of World War II right here in Natick. But of these four, over four million artifacts in general that I've acquired, four have a very special place in my heart. They ignited in me different passions, but passions that do have a common thread. They represent the best of the human spirit. They represent hope, perseverance, and leadership. When I hold them, I can feel really in touch with the moment of their creation. They inspire me to a deeper understanding of human nature. It all started with this 1806 half dollar. In 1955, when I was 12 years old, someone came into my parents' drugstore in Alston and paid for something with this coin. My mother noticed that it was a little bit larger than normal half dollars, and she gave it to me. It was the most momentous gift of my life. It ignited in me a new world, a passion to know what the world was like in 1806 and to know about all the people who had handled this coin in the 150 years. I felt a real human bond with them and a real curiosity. What were their aspirations? What did they think about the future, if they thought about it at all? After all, their future was just the next day, just like all of ours is. But this half dollar changed my life. My family had no money. The drugstore barely survived. So I took this coin to every coin dealer in Boston to get the best price I could, and I sold it for three dollars and a half. This was my IPO. This was the cash that started my business. And it was more important than that, it was the, what every kid really needs, their parents' confidence. With my family's tight finances, the three dollars and a half could have been considered fair game for the, for the family's budget. But they believed in what I told them I thought I could do with the money and my newfound passion for history. This coin will always be the tangible symbol of their support for my crazy collecting instincts. Six months after selling it, I had made enough money going through coins and from the gumball machines in my father's drugstore that I bought this back for five dollars. <laughs> so this has been the centerpiece on my desk for 60 years and every day it brings me back to the thrill of when I first held it, of the 12-year-old me exploding with curiosity about the past and the connection with the people of the past that's been my lifelong pursuit. For a long time, I was also pursuing a resolution of a conflict in my life. My father was a very compassionate person who helped a lot of people beyond what he could financially afford. In other words, we went broke. <laughs> I had to be more practical, but I was conflicted with my own interest in people. I sought out examples of caring people, but who also could be effective in what they were doing. And I had no idea that de decades later, I would discover that America's hero of World War II, General Dwight Eisenhower, then the president, was one of the greatest examples of what I had been searching for. For more than five decades, I've been fascinated with original historical letters and documents. Almost every iconic document of World War II is in the museum. But there is one that resonates with me more than all of the others. It cuts to the heart of every war, demonstrating a resolute leader who showed great toughness in battle 
and an equally great compassion for his soldiers. General Dwight Eisenhower rose very rapidly because he was very good at dealing with difficult generals. His understanding of foreign leaders resulted in his being named the overall commander-in-chief in Europe during World War II. On April 16, 1944, seven weeks before he would land 176,000 troops in one day on the shores of Normandy for the invasion of Europe, he wrote a letter to his wife, Mamie, that is the most extraordinary letter almost of anybody, but particularly of a military commander that I've ever seen. He wrote, how I wish this cruel business of war could be completed quickly. It is a terribly sad business to tote up the casualties each day, even in an air war, and to realize how many youngsters are gone forever. A man must develop a veneer of callousness that lets him consider such things dispassionately. But he can never escape a recognition of the fact that back home, the news brings anguish and suffering to families all over the country. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, wives, and friends must have a difficult time preserving any comforting philosophy and retaining any belief in the eternal righteousness of things. War demands great toughness of fiber, not only in the soldier that must endure, but in the home that must sacrifice their best. At this time, Eisenhower had been commanding the Allied armies for a year and a half. He was acclaimed for all of the defeats of the German forces. But this letter expresses what touched his heart, his humanity, and his recognition of what leadership required and the price hundreds of thousands of people were paying. His feelings for his men, for the reality of war, and the necessity for his dispassionate leadership exemplified to me ultimate leadership. This letter is the response to everyone who talks about winning wars. America lost over 420,000 soldiers in World War II. And as Eisenhower wrote, for these families, everything was lost. His compassion and effective leadership resonates so deeply with me that we're going to have his, this letter inscribed on the walls of our new museum building when we open it in two years. This ordinary looking rock captures the essence of leadership on a different but equally profound level. I cherish its history every day as I see it also on my desk. I have an interesting desk. <laughs> it represents perhaps the greatest leadership story ever. Ernest Shackleton was the most remarkable explorer of the great age of polar exploration. The race to be the first to get to the South Pole was the 1900s equal to the getting a man on the moon. It was the obsession of everybody. In 1901, Shackleton was part of the Discovery Antarctic Expedition, and together with the leader, Robert F. Scott, set a new furthest south record, just short of the South Pole. Shackleton refused to go further, believing they couldn't get back to their base if they continued. He knew where the line in the snow was, that they couldn't go beyond. Scott, in 1912, reached the South Pole, but he couldn't get back. Scott and all his men died in the snow. In 1914, Shackleton set out to cross the 1,500 miles of Antarctica by dog sled. This turned into the greatest triumph of leadership under the most appalling conditions in history. Shackleton's endurance expedition with 27 men arrived in the fall. Antarctica was the most hostile place on Earth and they found the conditions much colder than they expected. They fought through pack ice 
until their ship was completely trapped in a solid sea of ice. There could be no hope of rescue. There was no radio to, to contact people. And there wasn't anything anybody could do, even if they could have. But Shackleton was confident that in spring, the ship would break free. His leadership kept morale high. But in the spring, the cold continued, and their ship was being crushed by the ice. Shackleton set up camp on the ice, and his goal became the survival of every man. He hoped that the ice drift would push them towards land. But after five months, the drift ice began to break up. They launched their lifeboats onto the ice. And after seven days in the open boats, they set foot on land, the first land they had been on in 497 days. They had no hope of rescue. Shackleton's leadership held his men together. His motto, strength lies in unity. Combined with his understanding of the psychology of every one of his men, saved them from the freezing Arctic waters, but they were now on a desolate, ice-covered, uncharted island called Elephant Island. There were seals and penguins for a mon monotonous diet, and the only shelter was under their lifeboats. Their only hope was a whaling station on the tiny island of South Georgia, 800 miles away, across the roughest sea on Earth. It was the longest of long shots, but the only one. But Shackleton was not a leader who gave up on himself, his men, or life. The strongest of the lifeboats was reinforced with wood from the others. It was 22 feet long. Shackleton and five men would attempt the impossible. By the 10th day, they ran out of water, and their boat was leaking so badly they had to constantly bail it out. On the 15th day, they sighted land. It was the greatest open boat voyage in recorded history, and the great, greatest epic of the human spirit. Shackleton led his men to superhuman feats and maintained their morale in the most hopeless situations. The 22 men he left on Elephant Island couldn't be reached for months. But when his rescue boat came within sight, his first thought was to count the men. Everyone was saved. All 28 would return home. This photograph of Shackleton and his five men leaving Elephant Island for South Georgia in the lifeboat was Shackleton's personal photograph and stayed with him for the rest of his life. Shackleton carried this rock from Elephant Island in his 800-mile open ocean voyage. He kept this rock also for the rest of his life, his tangible memory of what he and his men had gone through against all the odds. Holding this memento fills me with awe. This rock represents everything courageous in the human spirit. Eisenhower led hundreds of thousands of men in war, knowing that many would not survive, but maintaining a deep concern for the families of all those that were lost. Shackleton led 27 men by deeply caring about every one of them. The window into history, the 1806 half dollar opened for me, led me to finding these two extraordinary individuals who combined effective leadership with deep compassion. And it also led me to this manuscript by Washington Irving. Irving was America's first international best-selling author. His early successes were Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And he continued his career with novels into the American West. In 1831, he was living in London when he wrote this manuscript. It came up for sale in an auction in 1976, and I knew that the extensive catalog would attract a lot of attention. I spotted this piece right away and fell in love with it, but my great fear was that Malcolm Forbes, the publisher, and one of the richest Americans would spot it and I'd have no hope of buying it. I've never been so nervous waiting for an auction lot to come up. I was sitting behind Forbes, 
And when it came up for sale, he was busy talking to his son sitting beside him. <laughs> I couldn't believe he wasn't bidding. Because the manuscript expressed everything that Malcolm Forbes wrote in his editorials. It was everything his magazine stood for. When the gavel came down and I owned it, I was ecstatic and I was actually stunned. This manuscript expresses what is for me the essence of America. Quote, one of the most striking characteristics of an American is his self-dependence. Born to no fortune he knows from his earliest years that he has nothing but his own mental and bodily exertions to rely on in the great struggle of existence. This self-dependence produces a remarkable quickness and versatility of talent. He turns his mother wit, as the Indian does his knife, to all purposes and is seldom at a loss. At his first outset in life, the world lies before him, like a wilderness of his own country, a trackless waste through which he must cut his own path. But what would be a region of doubt and despondency to another mind appears to him a land of promise, a region of glorious enterprise tinted with golden hope. This manuscript represents my life. In the 1950s, I believed that in America, you could be whatever you worked hard enough at, that the station of your birth didn't condemn you, that America was the world of hope, if not glory. For me, it was a land of promise, a region of glorious enterprise, tinted with golden hope. I have lived with this belief for the past 60 years, since my mother gave me that 1806 half dollar. I have lived the American dream. Be open to the ideas and beliefs that resonate with your own soul. Maybe it's a person, an article or book, or a movie that inspires something inside of you. Maybe it's an artifact that begins a journey of discovery. Find the spark inside of yourself. Fan it into a bonfire of inspiration. Be passionate about discovering that the greatest adventure is exploring yourself. The American dream is alive and well. It is in your own heart and soul. Go after it. It's the secret of life. Thank you.